welcome to another episode of the Seraphine podcast. I'm Seraphina Rocha, and today we have the beautiful Haley Lewis. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Thank you. I appreciate it. You might recognize Haley from 41 Action News Sports. Um, she's the sports anchor for them. And boy, what a job people <laughs> probably right now wish that they could be where you were. Um, what? Uh, not, well, not this time last year. Jesus. It was right before the season started, but talk to me um, just a little bit about what it's like to do mm. what you do. Oh, it's fun. It's definitely, it's fun. It is tiresome. I thought about it the other day. I was getting up and I was like, oh, I'm so tired. I don't want to go to work. And then I thought, girl, you're going to Arrowhead to cover the Super Bowl champions. Do you understand how many people are envious of that role? The fact that you get to walk in and talk directly to Coach Reed and, and, and Patrick Mahomes. I mean, not right now. Everything's on Zoom. We are yeah. all very socially distanced. But that, the fact that that is what I, what I get to do is just, it's phenomenal. I mean, it's a bunch of relationships and a bunch of building that chemistry with people and developing uh, where you can speak to them about anything and learn about these players and how much more they are than just players and, and that they have these wonderful families and backgrounds and stories and uh, charities that they love to give back to. So it's a lot of fun. It is a high pressure job, obviously, because you're always on a time crunch yeah. and you always are running around trying to get things done and getting wind blown at Arrowhead. If you don't know, it is a wind tunnel over there <laughs> and then trying to look decent on TV and run back and anchor at the station and um, but yeah, I wouldn't trade it for the world. It is definitely a lot of fun and in a good industry. And I mean, heck, who wouldn't love to be able to do what do what I do? And oh, I mean, you give me goosebumps because honestly, <laughs> I, I I shared with you that I was a former broadcast journalism right, right. major. And boy, when you you know you have to pay your dues, mm -hmm. and it sounds like you had to pay them. We're gonna we're definitely gonna talk oh, about that. <laughs> I probably got more to pay. <laughs> uh, it's it's kind of crazy, but you come from a family mm -hmm. that um, your father was a football coach, correct? Right, right. And your mom was a school counselor, so mm -hmm. it's kind of in your blood to have like what I call spirit and then also really the love of the game because right. I think that if you've got someone who is advocating for the school like a counselor mm -hmm. like the, the health of the students mentally mm -hmm. and then you have a father who is literally the str the strategist behind the right. plays um what a cool like foundation mm -hmm. to be able to to do what you do. So talk to me about what your high school life was like to have parents <laughs> like that. Well, uh, to have my dad as a head coach in high school, I sure as heck did not get a date. No one wanted to date <laughs> coach's daughter. Uh, so I didn't start dating really till college, but it was, it was so much fun having that kind of upbringing. I think a lot of people get into sports broadcasting for different reasons. And a big reason that I got into it was because it was already the dinner topic table. You know, that was the thing that we talked about all the time, 24 seven, was talking about sports and then getting to see it firsthand in a lot of interviews for jobs, they always ask you, you know, why this field? Why this? And yes, am I a sports fan? Absolutely. Yes. Do I love watching games? For sure. But I've also gotten to see the ins and outs of the industry by following my dad's career, watching him as a football player and then going on to be a coach and then also seeing my younger brother develop as a football player and play in college. And then to see the special dynamic that my parents had in this specific industry to watch him Go to, we were, you know, small towns, big towns, wherever. We would go from, you know, rural Missouri to Kansas City and these different areas. And I would watch him just devote himself to to not only the game but to his players he was all about being a father figure to his players and for a lot of those players they did not have that at home they did not have that kind of influence that guidance and and I remember over the years of what doing what I've done and putting my dad on my social media or things I have so many people reach out to me and explain to me how much of an influence my father was to them or how my dad was the only father figure that they ever had or how he was the only person who um believed in them and, and so he's become this this not only a rock for my family but also a dad for so many other kids and that was for me was just so moving and then to see my mom kind of go alongside him and we, she you know would try to go work at whatever high school he was at and and get to help kids in, in guidance and she also was a special needs um, aide for many years and that was just her heart and like I was sharing with you before my parents, you know, they both went to college, they got their master's degrees, and they, they had many talents that they could have pursued, but they are so passionate about giving back and being teachers and, and pouring into children, and they 
they did just that with us, with us three kids. And then to see them do that um, w- with so many other kids and, and know that I got to share my parents with all these other kids and, and that they helped so many people get these phenomenal opportunities that they never would have had my parents not believed in them or taken the time to talk to them. So That's so cool the way that you just said that. So I was going to ask you. Mm-hmm. My question was, you must have read my mind psychically. <laughs> Because I was going to ask, how did it feel to share your parents with other kids? And you said, Mm -hmm. I got to. Right. That's a generous heart. I mean, because there's a lot of people who have coaches for dads and they have counselors for mom. And they bitch about, you know what? (laughs) Dad was never there for me. Mom was never. And you're, you're, you're letting me know like the cup runneth over. Right. By using and choosing those words. They're probably the most giving people. And I, I even think about them and how much I, um, do not deserve the family that I have. And I look at my grandparents and I'm like, oh, no wonder my parents are the way they are because my grandparents gave everything to give everything to their kids so that they could have, the point of it was to raise children so that they could have far more than you ever had. And to raise children so they can be far more successful than you ever were because that's what the point is, is sacrificing everything to give that to to your children so that hopefully I can do that one day for, for my children that will probably come 25 years from now. But eventually pouring that back into them Uh, so yeah I mean the thing about it is I was so when I look at my childhood no we weren't rolling around in in crazy amounts or you know we never had this awesome house that we just moved into is perfect we always fixed them up we always flipped the home you know we always my parents always drove very used cars and (laughs) and and it just was the life but the thing is a, I never worried about where my next meal came from. Yeah. I never worried any of my parents were ever going to harm me. Yeah. I never worried emotionally, physically, nothing. I got to go home every night and lay my head knowing that my parents would not get divorced the next morning, knowing that my parents would always stay together and that they would always pour into us and that like that's such the emotional support and, and guidance that I was given from them. I didn't need anything else. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like yeah. I had a lot of friends who, who lived in bougie neighborhoods yeah. and I had those bougie things and I drove yeah. my... 2002 Camry all the way to the ground and oh god we, and that yeah. was fine because yeah. the the family was so much worth it, it was so much greater of a value to me than ever having any of that and I recognize that now so much more as an adult yeah. probably than I ever did uh as a teenager it's crazy to hear you talk too because you know I when I was first shown a photograph of you and they were like <laughs> you know this girl is so She's dynamic, you know, I mean, literally like those, that's like, when I think of words, you know, that are positive, it's like Mm -hmm. dynamic. When I saw, I was like, you know, you, you are blonde, you are blue eyed, you are on your resume, you're former Miss Tennessee. Fall into the stereotype very well. (laughs) 100%. And, and it's, and in this day and age, a lot of people Mm -hmm. are quick to prejudge in the world of, influencer nation Mm -hmm. and I talk a lot about it's wonderful if you are you know if you're doing it you're making money off of it you're you found your niche but are you are you impacting do you have an impact do you go Mm -hmm. beyond just a picture a paid I I love this company do you believe in it what do you stand for so when I looked at your photographs I went into complete you know, trying to tick off the boxes, right. you know, and then I, I went and I read your resume and then you went to literally like the Ivy League of the <laughs> South. So uh, Vanderbilt and, um, oh, my oh, sister sorry, not Vanderbilt, Belmont, Belmont, Belmont. Belmont yeah. I said, girl, I did not have the grace to get into Vanderbilt. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> right. And then, and then, um, the thing that blows my mind is when you have, pageant Mm -hmm. people normally assume absolutely that there's some kind of money in there Mm -hmm. and I want you to talk to me a little bit about first of all how you decided to go to school in Tennessee Mm -hmm. and talk to me about how you got to go to college because you didn't come from a lot of money right and what brought you into the pageant world and how you did that yeah, so when I when I think about college, I remember again, if you know anything about the education or the education system, you know that teachers are grossly underpaid for what yeah. they do. Um, 
and this is no brag at all, but right now my brother, who is a first year graduate of college, me and my sister, who have all graduated, all on our own salaries, our first year out of college, make more than my parents ever made combined when they were raising three kids. So how they did what they did and how they gave us what they gave us, I still don't understand. And there's sometimes when my mom says certain things like, oh, I don't have the money for that. I'm like, mom, go buy the outfit. Like go spend that on yourself because you've already poured so much into everyone else. And I just, I need to do better of living a selfless lifestyle like that because they amplify that. And it's just crazy to even think that on less than any of us ever made coming out of college that they raised three kids and we all went to phenomenal schools and now have great jobs because they set us up for that. But the the thing that was very known about that situation was, you know, hey, we financially don't have the money to support you. We would love to send you to college with all this money, but we don't. So you need to bust your butt for four years in high school to figure out scholarships and figure out a way to get to that school that you want to go to. Now, all three of us obviously had ambitions to go to, you know, I I wanted to get out of Kansas City because like I was sharing with you, Kansas City was not cool (laughs) in 2011. No. Okay. Power and light was barely a thing. I know. (laughs) No. And it was not a thing that you went to. No. Um, no. (laughs) It just, I was like, and also everyone who heard anything about Kansas assumed that Kansas was this middle of the podunk nowhere in a cornfield and we had couches on our front lawns. Like people just did not have this conception of Kansas City like we do today. And so I wanted to get as far away as I could. And my sister was a year older than me and we're only 14 months apart. And she was at Vanderbilt because she is a scholar and a half. That girl Mm -hmm. is just, and she was homecoming queen. I mean, it just, now I got a bigger crown eventually. And I still (laughs) give a crap about that. But she was so, um, just so gifted and so smart. And so she got, you know, a full ride to Vanderbilt and, and definitely earned every single bit of it and went to school there. And I went and visited her when I was a senior yeah. and there was a school across the street called Belmont, which was a liberal arts college that was much more my vibe of like yeah. music and, and, yeah. uh, and all this, um, you know, just, it was different. And I wanted yeah. to, I wanted so badly to go and I figured out what it took to go there and I figured out a way to get scholarship and I figured out a way to finance it all together. And, um, with a little bit of aid from my parents on, on a parent plus loan, basically them just signing their, credit away yeah. to me and then me paying for it all. <laughs> um, I got to go there and it was a grind. I worked three jobs every single year. I mm-hmm. uh, busted my boote to be able to afford to join a sorority because everyone's doing yeah, that. Yeah, totally. I so badly mm-hmm. wanted to do it and I found all these different ways of how to earn money. I mean, I remember working at Golden Corral as a server, <laughs> worked at Chili's as a server, yeah, worked yeah. in the athletic department, was a babysitter because girls, if you are in college, be a babysitter. Yeah, no You kidding. will make bank. An au pair. Oh, yes. <laughs> you, I mean, I, half the time when I was babysitting, I got to go on these phenomenal trips that yep. they would take me on. And I just was so blessed to be able to experience that because I was with a wonderful family that was allowing yeah. me to, you know, watch over their kid. And so that's how I kind of got to school. And when I got to school and kind of realized how much it costs to go to a private university about two years into it, that's when I found the Miss America organization. So everyone has this, you know, concept of a beauty queen uh, being this girl who's been like a toddlers and tiaras, the honey boo boo who grew up with like her parents bedazzling her dresses since she was two. Yeah. You know, like the ones who are curtsying and they come from money in the South. I grew up under the bleachers on Friday Night Lights. And I remember when in Miss Tennessee, they asked me what my favorite food was and I said concession food <laughs> but it was truthful because we were allowed to treat ourselves on Friday nights yeah. my mom would let us eat yeah. at the concession and so I was like hot dogs man yes that's oh, my favorite yeah. concession yeah. food I got coke on a Friday night okay yeah. that was the one time we were able to eat out and do yeah. do the you know candy and coke and everything I love that. um and so oh, it would just, uh, when, when my sorority sister mentioned me how much money you can get from the Miss America organization, scholarship money. So it goes yeah. directly back. Now you have to put in a heck of a lot of work and you give a year of service afterwards. Um, but she kind of explained it to me and I was like, all right, 
<laughs> I'm doing that. Okay, if that's how much I can make and get out of debt quicker and finish my college degree, heck yes, I'm going to go, you know, beep bop around in a bikini and five inch heels in yeah. front of my dad and be like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, I had always been into personal fitness. My yeah. dad raised us to know how to weight lift. We had been running the track for years with him growing up and he had always coached me in athletics. And so I was like, all right, I'm an athletic girl. Let me get yeah. into like peak shape. Um, I'll figure out how to talk and do all this and it's just going to come naturally. And I had a band of girls behind me help me figure it out. And it was the perfect storm. I mean, it just somehow worked out. And then I end up at Miss America and I'm like, uh, this is like only my like third patch you know, like I don't know what I'm doing that's so crazy so talk to me about um your year of service right what what, what was that like um and then what you were involved in mm-hmm. so when I was when I was in college and in my sorority I was the philanthropy chair and we were heavily involved in Children's Miracle Network which was a big organization obviously as we all know that funds children's health and hospitals to where if you can't afford it that you never have to worry that your child's care will be taken care of and when I was younger and my dad was working um, as a teacher my dad was misdiagnosed with Graves disease but he actually had thyroid cancer and he for many years was losing paid days as a teacher which you don't get many and then ended up completely having to take off all this time and my mom again not wasn't working at the time raising three kids she had an infant and two toddlers yeah I was trying to figure out how to make ends meet while my dad's in the hospital getting radiation uh, with thyroid cancer and again this is also like our dad so it's just it was devastating to go through that and to watch that financial strain for my parents um so the children's miracle network paid into that hospital that i happened to be at and when I, and so that, that set my parents back financially. So the point is when I had an injury later on in life and I was seven or six or seven, I believe when I broke my wrist and I had, it messed up my growth plates. Mm-hmm. I needed um, additional therapy and different things to help that would go outside of my parents' medical insurance. Children's Miracle Network is the organization that funded that payment. Wow. So my parents never saw a bill from the hospital. So it all came full right. circle. So that when I found out bumps. when I found out that that was the organization that my sorority would be paired with, I was like all in. I'm like, this is something that gave my parents a break and it gives so many other kids a break in drastically different situations where they actually have something way worse going on medically. And so I got heavily involved in it. And then it just so happened to be the Miss America organization's national platform as well. It, it just all... Fell. Yeah, if you don't believe in fate, <laughs> if you don't believe in a higher being, it's hard yeah. for me not to say that because they're, I mean, it just all came together, whether that's the universe or, or God. But for me, I was like, this has been placed in my path for a reason. Wow. So I dived right in with it. And for for the whole year of service, you give a year of service and you serve um, for education and you also serve the entire state of Tennessee for a year. So you take off a year and you go to all the Children's Miracle Network funded hospitals and you visit these kids and you get to basically wrap your arms around them and you walk in that door and you have a crown on and they think you're a real princess. And that's all they need to know because they don't know anything else. Yeah. And I think in the morning as I'm getting ready, and I remember this many times, I was exhausted. I had to drive four hours to Bristol, then all the way back to Memphis and this, this, and this, and I'm tired. I have to shove this crown on my head and place those bobby pins in and it freaking hurts your head. Yeah. And I was like, I'm sick and tired of this. And then you show up in a hospital and I got to meet one of, the, one of the little girls that I will never forget. Got to meet her, and um, she was an orphan who had just been adopted and brought over from a country in Africa. And, oh my goodness, she was just the sweetest little girl ever, and she wasn't reacting really much to what I was doing. I went and sang Frozen. I would always sing to the kids and get down, put my crown on them. And she was so elated and kept clapping her hands but couldn't speak. And I found out that she had been assaulted and had come from an orphanage where her siblings were assaulted and they had poured acid down her throat so she couldn't even speak. And it was just like, oh my God, like that's insane that someone went through that but has so much joy and is so elated to see a complete stranger come and talk to them. And I just was like, you don't have hardship. No. (laughs) Pull it together. Like the heels don't hurt that bad. No. You're good. No. And it was so cool to see that that little girl was being treated and was going to have this phenomenal life here in the States with her new family and hopefully will heal from what happened. And those were the kind of stories that really stuck with me. Or or I went into another hospital and this was um, in East Tennessee 
and there was a super, super sweet girl. She was about 16 or 17, and that's 18 is the age gap where you get cut off um, from funding. And she was had terminal cancer, so she was going to maybe, uh, they said three or four days, I believe, when I showed up. And you could, when you encounter someone who is dying, it is vastly different than um, speaking to someone who, who, who is sick or you yeah. know when death yeah. is there. Yeah. And I got to sit with her and she just was so excited because she was she did make a wish and she got to go meet Cinderella and the new Cinderella movie had just came yeah. out. And I went and sat with her and I put my crown on her and I had photos with her. And then the publicist called me three days later to let me know that she had passed. And her mom told me that she slept with my headshot <laughs> like every night. And again, as adults, we all look at pageantry and think this is some little chick walking around her little heels thinking she's all that with a crown on her head. And it's not. It's not for the yeah. adults. It's not no. for you. No. It's really not. No. It's for the kids that you go and you meet. And you you might be the only person that tells them they're worth something. And, and they will latch on to that forever. You meet the kids in these schools where I met a kid in a school in, I believe it was on the border of Virginia and Tennessee. And he was a, a unfortunately a product of incest. Yeah. Uh, not unfortunately that he was born. him, so he yeah. was the sweetest thing ever, but unfortunately what he had been through yeah. and he was tormented at school and bullied. And I got to be the one who came in and I had a personal lunch with him one-on-one -on -one in front of the entire cafeteria. And he referred to me as his girlfriend. I was like, yeah, I'm your <laughs> girlfriend. Of course I am. And he's like, I've just never had anyone. And I just remember thinking like, gosh dang, man, like to feel that way. And so I came back and visit him again and, and got lunch with him and everything. And just to see like, again, it's not for the adults. It's for, it's for the kid to make them feel like, you know, maybe they don't have someone at home making them feel that way. Maybe they don't have guidance. Maybe they don't have the right perception. I was raised to have a wonderful perception of myself because I have phenomenal parents. Not everyone is that lucky. Do you think that's where you get the ability to hold that space? Absolutely. It's, it's super heavy. Because it's not mine. Yeah. It was a gift. It's mine to, to pour into other people because as we've all learned in this world, there's not enough love. Yeah. Like we need more compassion. We need more kindness. We need more people willing to give up themselves to give to other people. And so if I was so greatly blessed with love and compassion and kindness, why would I not? Like that, that was like, of course I would give that to, in, to anyone to feel special or significant, even with like girlfriends or friends in my life to make them feel significant gives me gratification knowing that I'm able to validate their, their worth that maybe wasn't yeah. validated at a young age or something. So that was what Miss Tennessee was. It was not, it was so very little Miss America. Yeah. It, it was two weeks of my life that I competed for Miss America, which was yeah. phenomenal, but it was not about Haley. It was about the role that I stepped into to fill that so that people could be influenced by that person. Yeah. It was not about Haley. So this is all at age what? 20? I was 21. Wow. 21? Yeah, 21. So that's a lot. That's a lot for any 21-year-old. Right. And you graduate school. Yeah. And you've experienced <laughs> like a hell of a lot of life. Right. And you, you go into this broadcast world because mm -hmm. you're in front of a camera and you obviously know how to hold your composure. Right. Um, but as someone who can hold my composure really well, um, I'm the biggest empath. Right. <laughs> and <laughs> It's um, hard not to feel it. It's really hard. And I'm good. I'm mm -hmm. good. I'm good. And there's, there's this moment to where I realize if you don't have your your well does empty at some point sure and there has to be someone to fill that mm -hmm. empty well but i realize my wells are really deep mm -hmm. and i had to go through a lot to find someone who could pour back into me right so that i could be that that person that i could mm -hmm. show up so when you left at age, what, 22, 23 from Tennessee? I left 22, yeah. I was, or right about whenever I graduated. So I was 22 when I graduated, and I stuck around for a little bit. And then, yeah, I think I was 23 when I ended up moving. 
um, and to Oregon. <laughs> Oregon. <laughs> to so talk to me about Kansas City, Tennessee, Oregon. It was, I, I so talk to me a little bit about that transition because it's right. big going from Tennessee mm-hmm. to Portland. Or my sister's from Portland and she's covered in tattoos <laughs> and she is a, a bass guitarist and she's a badass. But she's had to go through a lot of growth and right. and it's a, it's an interesting town. It's a very self righteous town because sure. they can tell you you don't know shit because mm-hmm. you're from the south. Um, I'm, I'm so curious about when you went there mm-hmm. and where your headspace was at because you went from being this very philanthropic right. space holder and like connector mm-hmm. to then it's like this, hi, I'm reporting from blah, blah, blah. Right. It, it became it, self-absorbed very quickly. Yeah. And talk to me a little bit about what transitioned in your life because this is like this beautiful, inspiring sp- mm-hmm. story, but there's also within everybody sure darkness and 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 when you the light starts to go out so talk to me about going from this light of being mm-hmm. miss america to then going into broadcast journalism and then finding this balance of like where you are now right it, it was a hard transition i think especially because after being like you said just this little princess who, you know, got to do all these amazing things that were just put on my plate and I got to pour and pour and pour. I was exhausted, like mentally just exhausted. And also by, it's not that I was carrying anyone's burden, but to just see all that I saw. To witness it. And and then, and then to, you feel guilt a lot of times because you're okay. Yeah. And, and there's nothing wrong with being okay, but it does definitely make you feel like, oh man, like you kind of feel guilty about your privilege and what and 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 how do I I'm trying to give so much of it like what do I do and then going back to school finishing school coming back to being normal and trying to be like okay like now I'm in classes and now people are looking at me yeah (laughs) like this is weird (laughs) okay I am normal I don't wear makeup half the time yeah yeah and I roll out of bed and go to and so finishing as a college student and then trying to figure out my path of like okay where am I gonna go and then finding out that, okay, this is really, this is the passion for me. I, I absolutely love this. But it is a very egotistical, self-absorbed role. It is it is a TV personality, as anyone mm-hmm. knows. And I'm not saying anyone in TV is self-absorbed, but you have to, you're, it's you. You're yeah. the brand. Mm-hmm. You're the one you're selling. It's, you know, it's yeah. a hard industry. You got to stick up for yourself and, and people are going to want to tear you down in any which way that they can. Because simply, be, it's crazy to me how people are simply just intimidated by people who are okay with themselves. I know. Who are like, I'm just good with me and confident with that. And for some reason, that's like this very like, ah, like Yeah, there's got to be something. Like something's something, wrong yeah. with her. No, I'm just good. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. I'm okay yeah, with yeah. this. Um, and so that was hard for me to understand that people would just be uncomfortable with the fact that you're comfortable with yourself. Yeah. That's odd. And so moving out to Oregon, which I had never been to that state, it was on the West Coast, I had never lived out there, I had never um, seen that, you know, Portland, like you said, is weird, (laughs) and they like to keep it weird. And me also not having a tattoo on my body, not having a single piercing, but my ears being pierced. You're the weird one, (laughs) right? And I like, you know, I like to wear colored lip glosses and all these different things. I remember walking out there and just, my new coworkers were like, dude, we thought we were gonna hate you. Like all this, this, and this. And I just remember being so, A, that sucks. But B, like I love the fact that you took the time to get to know me and now you know that I'm a goof and a half and a weirdo. Yeah. <laughs> and, all, and, and to see the inside of me and not to realize that I don't come like without scars yeah. as well. Now, I do a very good job of covering them because I know all the great concealers, but it's like, I don't, it's not that I haven't had pain. Yeah. Like, trust me, we all do. And a lot of times we just like to keep that private. Yeah. Um, and so going out there, it was a very good growing experience for me. I got to learn. And like I said, learn different walks of life and see how other people had different religions, how other people had different viewpoints, how other people had different political views and, and absorb all that. Because I mean, that's what makes us thrive is that we all have those, those differences and not being, you know, so strong in one way and like, you can't believe that and you can't believe that and just understanding that, okay, we all weren't raised the same. Yeah. We're all gonna have different life experiences. We're all gonna have different things that happen that make us feel a certain way about a certain situation. And as long as we can have a constructive, 
respectful, kind conversation without destroying another person in it. Yeah. Like that, that was a great thing for me to learn was like, okay, all right, there are different people in this world and not everyone gets it how I get it and I'm not going to get it how they get it, but let's try to find, let's, let's have the conversations. And I loved so many conversations I ha- had out there because I grew a lot of my perception because your perception's your reality, right? Totally. And so when you live in a little bubble, you don't see all that. And for me, I got, I got my bubble popped and it was good. So what, so I guess it's interesting because the one, where, while you're talking, I, it goes back to a conversation I had with my friend, her mm-hmm. name's Kara Quigley and she, she gives a lot of talks um, just about diversity, religion, right. culture. And she was talking a lot about um, kind of the social justice movement. Mm-hmm. And she said to me, she goes, you know, so many of us were brought up with this. We're all the same. Yeah. You know, we, we, we don't treat anyone different. We're all the same. We need to treat each other that we're all the same mm-hmm. because then that takes away from prejudice, right? Right. And then she said, you know what? That's so messed up because if we don't understand our differences yeah. and we don't understand the things that are different, unique, uh, yeah. unique and just, she said to me, she goes, then, then there's, there's no way to ever come together. And she goes, and the funny thing is, is we'll never be the same and we'll never be this clean, perfect picture. Mm -hmm. She's like, we all are these kind of broken pieces from different parts of the world with different parents. And when we come together, she goes, all we can hope for is that we can create a mosaic because it's the, the, the stuff of life, you know, Mm -hmm. that gunk, that's in stained glass windows yeah. that holds a picture <laughs> together. She's like, those, these conversations, when we're listening to mm-hmm. someone, you find the gunk mm-hmm. that's like, oh, I hear you on that. <laughs> and even though you may have been raised in Kansas City and this person is like in tattooed mm-hmm. in Portland or they come from Ghana, I mean, the bottom line is, is that there are these, there's some gunk in life that's right. like a common like denominator. Mm-hmm. So, I love hearing that this is like a part of your mosaic is mm-hmm. like you were this pageant queen that like <laughs> had to go back to being a college student and then you moved to Portland and then you're like, oh shit, like, okay, what, what the fuck now? Pageant queen. <laughs> that's like, everyone's judging. And then Portland, why, why did you come back to Kansas city? Well, so by way of a bad relationship is how I got back. Here. Yeah, uh, welcome to my life. I, we that that right, gunk. Right. I was in Australia thinking I was going to save the wombats, <laughs> and then I freaked the hell out and was like, "Get me the hell away!" And mm-hmm. the only place was like the stereotype of there's no place like home. There isn't. I clicked my heels mm-hmm. and I needed to go back to mom and dad and like center myself, and right. and I felt like a disaster. And it's hard not to because I was around a lot of people who got married right out of college or who got married and had their sweetheart forever. And and to I think it's really hard to publicly face the fact that this just fell to crap. You yeah. know, it and just you were a work. princess. Yeah. And you were a princess and with got dumped. Crown. Yeah, totally. Right. And you got dumped. Right. <laughs> that's so right. And that's right. And when you ah, oh, and it's like it's crazy because when you're in the public eye, mm-hmm. in any way, shape, or form, but you were really in the public eye. And it just eye. was like, oh, I gotta slowly take these pings down and like oh, slowly it is totally, crawl back into my hole. Oh, it is, and you want to hibernate and heal. And I, yeah, and I did, and and it just was. I was, I was in a relationship. It was a conflict of interest for my job. We were getting engaged. We decided to, I said I'd move on to another job. And then we decided to move across the country to be together in Louisville. And and it was all hunky-dory and great. And I could tell things were a little, you know, yeah. but obviously as a female and being just trying to make everything work, I was trying to hold it together. Yeah. And in the back of my head, I'm like, this is wrong. This is wrong. This is wrong. Like, this is not for you. Yeah. And then end up there and, you know, just, I remember the conversation was, I just don't think you're the person I want to marry anymore. And I just don't think I, like, I just am losing feelings for you. I don't feel the same way. (laughs) And I was like, okay, (laughs) so (laughs) where are my stuff? (laughs) And I just remember being like, okay, because we had that conversation on the phone and then in person. And for me, and I know for you a lot, working out is an outlet. 
Yeah. And a saving grace and something that I do instead of doing something else. <laughs> it's yeah. what I do to bring myself um, mental sanity. Yeah. And I remember being like, okay, well, I have an orange theory class, so I have to go. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I got to make it to the gym. And I remember in the gym, I'm like, this is an hour that he doesn't get to control you. Yeah. So enjoy this. Yeah. And then walking out and being like, all right, reality is facing. Let's grab my stuff, call my parents, booked a flight, left. Why are you leaving? Um, that um, still baffles me. I, <laughs> uh, okay. Because I want to stay here with you. Yes. The person who just said, I don't love and you. And called off the wedding. Uh, Great. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I was yeah. like, all right, I'm leaving. And I left. And um, it was done for me the second, like from there on out, it was done. And I was like, all right, I'm moving home at 25. I have to embarrassingly tell all my friends how I just failed. Major. I have no job. I have no car. I have no savings, I have credit card debt, I have student loan debt I need to pay off, and I'm in over my head and have, I, like, I just remember just losing it. And the first three days was just like, couldn't get out of bed. And it wasn't, it wasn't even over him, it was just more the fact that I lost myself. Yeah. You know, I really did, I really lost who I was and had let it go so far to be so just pushed in this corner of who I was supposed to be and what I was supposed to say and what I was supposed to do and to, you know, to have someone have so much power over me that I would lose, I would lose everything that was me. Um, saying things that weren't, you know, the phrases that you're saying to try to please them, oh, yeah. but are not who you are at all. And that's something that you would, ne- I mean, just like no. sickening to my stomach to even think of that now. You become like a total, I talked, I talked in one of my past podcasts about imposter syndrome. Yes. And it's crazy because it's such a, it's such a learned behavior mm-hmm. when you're somebody who is trying to acclimate or assimilate or congregate or be when you're in a group right right, you either are like my sister who's like tattoos and fuck (laughs) you um, (laughs) and just like this is who I am Uh or you're somebody who's like you observe and you're like okay how can I how can I allow this to be the most harmonious environment how can I shift Mm -hmm. and move and then sometimes we move so far into that kind of mm-hmm. making people comfortable right. that we start to believe that we are comfortable and that we're not putting on this face. Right. And there are times to put on that face. When you're in the hospital with a child sure. who needs a hero, you put on the face mm-hmm. even if you feel like shit. Mm-hmm. And then there are times where you're with someone who's supposed to be loving you right and they're bringing you down Mm -hmm. and you look at them and you say it's okay and that's that's another face I know and it's like you have to it's okay to man up and to pretend Mm -hmm. for a moment that maybe you're someone different in that moment out of protection for yourself but if you keep doing it and doing it and doing it you start to lose sight I think of what it is you want and what it what is your true path right. and you start to get misled and 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 in going it, you're ending up with someone who tells you I don't love you anymore yeah stay with me <laughs> okay <laughs> you know yeah it just was for for me I, I think back on phrases that I said or things that I did in those moments where I wish I could go back and be like girl the things you would say now like I cannot believe I allowed I tolerated so much to where they thought that was acceptable yeah Like, what? How did you even allow yourself down that path? And I was, it was so much harder for me to face the embarrassment of leaving, saying it didn't work, cutting it off to where I literally would lose everything I worked for myself mentally to, to what? Keep it to, to to save face. Totally. Right? Totally. To save face. And, And then I, finally, when I was free of it, it was almost like, it was this huge weight off my shoulder of like, I'm so glad. I, I remember my grandma saying, if you go down that aisle and you don't want to, I'll walk out with you. And I was like, grandma, it might come to that. <laughs> Cause I, I am not letting this go. And I know what's wrong. Yeah. And, and just having the strength to be like, Hey, I'm going to fall flat on my face. Miss Tennessee, Miss yeah. blah, blah, blah. No, she failed. Okay. It happens. She failed terribly. And I got embarrassed and I lost a a career and I put my career for a guy on hold and I put myself into debt and I just, I freaking failed. 
is the best thing I ever did. Right? Doesn't it feel it the good? It's the best thing I ever did. And was to fall let, on my face. Yeah. And, 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 and move out of it. And you know yeah. what I just thought of is no wonder you got to cover the Chiefs the year that they won. <laughs> because you want to talk about a team right. that like yeah, kept pushing, it was always keep there, pushing, and keep then it just... pushing, keep pushing, keep pushing. And then it's like, oh, are we fucking failures? What are we? <laughs> and then they do it. Mm-hmm. It just, yeah. And that's the, that's the thing is that getting comfortable with, I'm going to, I'm going to suck until I'm good at it. Yeah. Like I got to be comfortable with, with being bad, embarrassing myself enough to where I will finally be good at it one day. You yeah. have to be comfortable with that. And that for me was my first public, like all those people back there <laughs> and all my friends, I had to call them all and tell them all. And then, you know, he starts taking down all these photos of me and this is this. And it just, it's, it's not, it really has so little to do with him. It's just more of what it had to do with me. Yeah. Yeah. It just was it. the pain of it and going through it and then being like, okay, so I am now for my godparents working in their, they own a snow plowing company. So I'm working in their front office and I am doing all their accounting and logging. And I'm also babysitting on the side. I'm also dog setting. And then I'm also coming over and painting one of my parents, friends trim on their floor. Uh, also anything at my parents' house that I could do. I sold everything that I practically had of value. I did a thousand garage sales and any which way I could afford to just pay off the debt every month. Yeah. I had a big chunk of payments I had to make every month. So there was no money for me. Yeah. And it was just trying to make that those ends meet and also trying to get back in the sports industry and then also trying to explain to people why I have a gap in my work. <laughs> Well, <laughs> I mean, you see what had happened. Yeah, one hundred percent. And I get that. I get that. I mean, who, like, it's they don't want to hire the dramatic girl who got messed up with the wrong no. person. It just doesn't look no, good on paper. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. But you know that thing that cracks me up is that is that is the gunk. Yeah. That like, let me tell you, when it comes to when like the door is open, mm -hmm. it's when you sit down in that interview. Yeah. And someone asks you that question. You know, I got hired when I finally told the truth. <laughs> Isn't that funny? I actually like I, every, every other way I would I would word it in a certain yeah. way. Yeah, you it wasn't it, it wasn't that yeah. I lied. I just made it prettier you put than a it crown was. On it. Yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah. I really yeah. made that thing have a sparkle. Yeah. And I sat down with this woman who I was interviewing with for this job in Kansas City, and I said, you know what? I dated the wrong guy. I followed him. And I put my career on hold, and it's the biggest mistake I ever made, and it sucked. And there's really no other be better way to say this, but I messed up and I had to, and I explained, I said, listen, I had nothing. And I had to move back in my parents, ego blow, number one, figure everything out and go to counseling and, and find myself again and mentally get healthy first and then work through all this. And I, and I just had to be honest. And she was like, okay, why don't you come in for the studio for an audition next week? And I was like, you are the first person who's ever heard me. And like who listened to me past, hey, it, it happened because I got involved with the wrong person. Cause usually it's like drama. No, it's yeah. not. That's life. But that's yeah. what, that, but it cost me about a bunch of my career. Totally. And then to hear that I get hired and then six weeks later in Miami for the Super Bowl, and they're winning the Super Bowl. And I'm just like, Oh my gosh, less than six months ago, you had nothing. Yeah. And to find out that, uh, by the way, my debt-free date is December 31st. And I'm so excited. I love it. To finally have it. everything done and to have savings <sighs> and to be have that big monkey off my back yeah. of just, oh, just this brick weight on my chest and to be done and to be like, oh my gosh, two years ago, you moved back to Kansas City and two years later, you are covering the Super Bowl champs. You are working towards a national job on TV. You are like, you financially are free you you have yourself again and then and just like two years of grueling yeah but man it feels good to like breathe yeah breathe like breathe <sighs> with ease yes and to be like i love who i am so much more now and i never would have been her had i not gone through that yeah so thanks for that oh, douchebag. I, I love it, right? <laughs> That's the one I thing you it. gave me. <laughs> I mean, it is. It is. It's just so crazy how 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 life just it's it's these different course of events that lead you to all these. And, and you know what? There's never a time where just when you 
can breathe. Yeah. I hate to say it, like something comes up mm -hmm. and you know, you gotta, you gotta repeat the cycle, but you have more, you have more tools in the toolbox mm -hmm. to deal with the yeah. different, like, I'm not barricades. so scared to fall yes. off now. Totally. And you don't have to put a crown on a turd. No. Yeah, exactly. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, you can, like, I mean, you don't have to. No if it's a, frogs. If it's, if it's a turd, it's a turd. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's our turd. And, and you, know, like, you know, and I guess it's just, it's so nice to be able to, to talk about it and be like, well, I'm not covered in it. Yeah. I flushed it down and I'm going. Yeah. So now, you know, I, I guess... What I'd like to know is, is that like what you, what you hope, what you wish for, for mm -hmm. the future, for yourself and what you hope and wish for, for the people who made you who you are, right. your parents. Well, I think my biggest thing is that I never want to lose who I am and I never want to fake who I am to please someone else. Because you're going to rub people wrong. You're going to have people who just don't like you because they don't like you. And that's fine. Yeah. But I never, ever want to fall like into that trap of saying certain things, being a certain way, and changing who I am at the core to please someone else for their validation, for their likeness. Because the truth of it is, not everyone in life will like you. And, I need, and, and when I finally got to that point, it was like, okay, all I can do is simply, I mean, there's everyone else is taken. I just need to work on me and being who that is and, and loving and being kind to others. And hopefully that, that leads me down a path where the majority of people like me, but if they don't, that's okay. Again, it's okay yeah. to not be liked because you're obviously doing something right. So <laughs> just that would be my biggest thing moving forward is to find that and to never lose my, my mental health was so much more important yeah. And to never lose that again and just and to never allow someone else to change it, it. It's so true. You allow them to make you feel the way that they want to make you feel yeah. and to never allow that to happen again. And I fight that daily. I think yeah. we all do. Um, but that's the thing that I'll never want to give up because you don't have to make things work. Yeah. No, you, you don't. don't. And I shouldn't in my 20s be trying to make things work. No. You should be in happy bliss. Like it, it will yeah. be okay. Yeah. And I will find someone who it will work with. Yeah. And that's, that's the path that I'm on. And for my future is also never changing my future for anyone else because it yeah. is, I'm the only one who is, no one's coming to save me. And I think I've gotten that pretty clear in my head. Yeah. This is my world, my path and my destiny. And for me to do that, I have to take full responsibility for past mistakes, for certain responsibilities that I have and, and realize that it's not just going to be lifted off my chest yeah. by the check that shows up at my house from whatever I entered and forgot about. And that, that is how you, you, you pursue life is just knowing, Hey, it's on your shoulders. Like I got to go for it. Um, and so for the future, obviously my goal is national television and for, I mean, goal, goal, I want to work for NFL network. That is my yeah. dream. Uh, it, you know, to be able to cover these stories and travel around and cover multiple teams and, and get to do that on national stage. And they would be lucky to have someone like oh, you. Because I, I can would already tell you, you, you <laughs> well, you've lived life and you've been on the field. You've stood by a coach. Right. And, uh, you know, I think it's pretty cool to know someone like that mm -hmm. is across from players asking right. them questions and learning about, about the game. I don't care about what they're doing. I don't care about breaking the news of this person got arrested. By this. No. I, I care about like getting to showcase that what you do on the field is about 4% of your life yeah. and getting to show all, all the, you know, the X's and O's. That's awesome. Like I, it's, yeah. it's fun to talk about the analytical side of things. Absolutely. Yeah. But, um, these people are so much more than people. And I love sharing people's stories. Right. So and it's that's like the, the princess part. analogy you gave of for <laughs> yeah. the children. Right. Like we want to believe in mm -hmm. that. We, when you get to, be at that level of a, right. of a sports player, you represent a dream mm -hmm. for somebody. And I think that that's the beauty of the responsibility. Right. It comes with weight. It comes with weight. And when, and when you wear the crown, mm -hmm. there's a responsibility. It's heavy. That's why you leave it where it is. <laughs> totally. <laughs> yeah. Totally. It's definitely, it, it comes with, with being, I think a lot of the reasons that athletes who stay professional athletes who do have success are not always the most athletic or the best at their position they're the ones who can handle being a professional who can handle being in the limelight who also have the ability to do that it really is a full 
It's, yeah. it's a full thing. It's not just one aspect yeah. of the job. As we've seen, there are phenomenal athletes who are no longer in the league because they yeah. can't keep their personal life together. Yeah. And it's unfortunate. And so that's the encompassing person that it takes to be in that kind of role. And it's very cool to showcase the mental discipline that comes along with that. 100% um, of the character building of just... And their like, stories of where they... Oh, I mean, the and what stories they do, they've oh, been through. Oh, And to be so where many, they are... Oh, my God. Blows it's, my mind sometimes. It's, it's so inspiring. Mm -hmm. And you just... To sit across from it and, again, right. hold that space. I can already tell right. that you will be able to hold that space and it'll like i said she should be on the nfl network <laughs> um and then when it comes to your your parents yeah. i i mean they must be like they're they they're must, awesome they must be really cool people they everyone who meets them is always like gosh your parents are so cool and yeah. the thing is a lot of times they're not cool because they're not yeah. my best friends no you know? i get it <laughs> they're not yeah. they're my parents and yeah. they'll tell me like it is because they're my parents first yeah. but um, if I'm one ounce of what they are, <laughs> that's, that's good enough. You know what yeah. I mean? If I can pour into my children, how they poured into us, I just, again, I don't deserve them. I, one day we've all, us kids have all talked about this, you know, like when we do this or this, like, what are we going to do? And like, I see these athletes buying their parents' cars or home and yeah. I can't wait till one day I can, you know, be like, listen, debt's gone. Like house done you guys get to pick up and go wherever you want. And like, I want it so badly being controlled of my own finances now so that I can do that eventually. Oh, I think you will. That's the point. I want to yeah. be able to give back and I want to take my mom on that shopping spree and I want yeah. her to have all the nice things she wants to have. And I want my dad to have every, you know, I bought him a Lululemon fanny pack <laughs> and he is obsessed with it. I he's like, it. should I wear it like this, this or that? should I wear it like this? And so he wears it on his hip when he's coaching and puts his chapstick in it. And he I thinks it's just the world. Have you ever seen Hope Floats with Sandra Bullock? Mm -mm. Watch it. It's an really? old 90s movie, but she's with her daughter in bed. Oh. I'm getting choked up <laughs> because uh, she's, she, she fails and she's got to go back to live with her mom. Yeah. And she's with her daughter. And she has this moment where she says, my cup runneth over. Oh. And I think that that's, it's obvious with you that their cup runneth over. And I think there's going to be really yeah. good things for you in the future. Well, it, I think if anything comes to me, it's because it's come through someone else first. And so, yeah, I, I it's been great. It's, um, like I said, I don't deserve them. So, yeah, they're, they're good people and they're good people to a lot of people and, as long as I can continue bringing people in their home so they can love them. I mean, that's why I always invite my friends over because I'm like, girl, you got to have wine with my mom. I love it. I love it. You'll, she'll listen uh, to everything, but she'll also analyze everything you're I'm saying because oh, she's a counselor. I love it. Well, I am so glad that I got to sit down with you today. And it's so weird because I just met you today. Right. And, and um, you're just a really, yeah. you're the real deal. I appreciate that. And thank you for hearing me because this is... Um, it's a little different to have like the, the roles I'm, reversed, right? Yeah. And also <laughs> this is stuff that I've never let out. I've oh. never told anyone these... I just let people think I just popped up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but that's the, you know, the truth is that the failure will hit you. And yeah. I hope that people learn from this that um, even the brightest people you think you see, everyone has someone who's tried to dim that. Yeah. So constantly remind yourself of that and as you move forward yeah it's like letting the light in it is it really is and, and allowing people sometimes to hold you hold up a mirror mm -hmm. to reflect that light back right. and be like you've got it mm -hmm. it's those people that put the box the box top on you that you're like oh yeah oh well i am so so glad I, we could talk for hours <laughs> i laugh because i'm like i don't want it to be over um but the last thing I'll have you do is if people want to just uh, follow your journey and what is mm -hmm. the future for you, where can they find you um, in social media and all the good stuff? And they can certainly watch oh, yes. you on the news. Yes, you can yeah. watch me or on Channel 41. Um, yeah. But I I have, I have, do not do TikTok. I'm too old for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I'm so uh, guilty of watching them all me too, on me Instagram. Too. I do too. There's one I love. There's Her name's Morgan something. Oh. And she does these like... To have a cute outfit, you put on a sweater. A, See, that's and then the she stuff does, I like. She makes me laugh till I cry <laughs> because she like has this dead blonde hair and she, it's, it's great. I I'll love show that. To you. See, or, okay, yeah. if it's TikToks about food or about clothing, <laughs> yeah, I'm all about yeah. it. But I'm not on TikTok. I am on Instagram and Twitter. Um, 
you can catch my LinkedIn, I guess. <laughs> if yeah. you but uh, it's, I believe it's at Haley Lewis Sports. I think mm-hmm. it's at Haley Lewis underscore sports. And that's where you can follow me and, and my journey. And I keep it, you know, I try to keep it as real as possible. There's yeah. plenty of bloopers that I post. <laughs> Yesterday, I posted a story about how I met a murder hornet. Oh, my God. And everyone's like, oh, my God, don't you know there are murder hornets? Uh, yes, I know it's not a murder <laughs> hornet, okay? It's a big wasp. Uh, yeah. it I felt understand. like a murder hornet but it was after me and you know when you're done with that camera you have to you have to pause as, after yep. a live shot in case anything has a delay yeah so I'm pausing and this, this mm, it's getting closer and closer and then I just bust off the screen. <laughs> so I try to share funny stuff and and the reality uh, of how glamorous it is not yeah um but yeah follow yeah. me on Instagram and follow my journey and Hey, the good thing is like, if you ever, I always, for young women or anyone in the industry, please reach out to me because I had so many wonderful people take the time to bring me up and help me along. And so I'm always open to conversations, coffee and, and helping people get there too. Ah, oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you so much. You are like, you are a light lady. So keep shining I, bright. I appreciate yeah. that. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you for tuning into another episode of the Sarah Fiend podcast, because you know what? Without the dark, there's no light. And without the light, uh, we don't learn from the darkness. So just, you know, keep understanding that you just got to fight. Keep fighting for that light. Thanks so much.